so according to a consensus of seven surveys amongst the global scientific community, 97% of scientists understand that the unprecedented acceleration of climate change in the 20th and 21st centuries is a result of human activity, with the primary contributing molecule being carbon dioxide. Do you feel that the University of Miami, as an institution of higher learning, bears a responsibility to lead the South Florida community and furthermore the global community in reducing emissions? Yes, absolutely. Um, universities have a responsibility to not just pursue excellence, but also be, pursue relevance. And, and those twin objectives actually reinforce each other. But in addition, we are an institution in our community. We are not just a university in Miami, but the University of Miami. So we need to be connected to the problems. And clearly, uh, several of the effects of climate change, including rising sea levels, are of huge importance to our community. And we, as a large organization employing uh, several thousand people, have uh, our own responsibility to reduce our carbon footprint and, and adopt uh, sustainable policies for the way we operate. So it's a triple uh, uh, responsibility of generating knowledge that benefits the entire globe, being connected to the concerns of our, of our community and, and being responsive to those concerns, and organizing our own work in a way that's sustainable. Do you think that the University of Miami is prepared to innovate new ways to create a sustainable tomorrow? Uh, yes, we, we are doing that. Um, uh, you know, we have a number of sort of intellectual assets. We have, we produce intellectual capital to deal with some of those challenges. And those are our various schools and colleges. One of our most uh, important uh, schools and colleges is the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. They are a leading um, a, a institution of higher learning involving both research and education around uh, uh, environmental concerns. But we also have you know, a Department of Geology at the College of Arts and Sciences. We have a, 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 a very good uh, uh, school of engineering and architecture dealing with issues of environmental resilience and actually having projects around environmental resilience. So, uh, and, and I would argue that even the, beyond the sciences, the, the social sciences have a lot to do because there is a, a societal ser series of issues, not the least of which is the way information is used and process, processed in the political process, uh, in the political debate, sorry. And clearly, climate change and other environmental issues, quite apart from the scientific dimension, have a political dimension which we study and we help to understand better and, and steer better. And finally, I would say that the humanities and the arts of the humanities, which we also cultivate as a comprehensive university, have a lot to tell us. There's a project <coughs> in the digital humanities here going on, analyzing uh, m m uh, hundreds of texts to see how other civilizations have been, have confronted potentially catastrophic uh, disasters l l like uh, rising sea levels. And, and there's a lot in through which uh, history, literary analysis, uh, uh, the analysis of artistic creation can help us illuminate the challenges we face today. So our unique advantage is we have this capacity to have a, an interdisciplinary problem-based focus. And some of the environmental challenges you are uh, mentioning are exactly that kind of, 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 uh, of problem. And we can bring this interdisciplinary wealth of resources to bear on them. So as you mentioned, the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences puts out some of the most groundbreaking research in the world right now. And this attracts PhD students, master's students, and professors from all corners of the globe to our university. I spoke with Dr. Paquita Zaidema of Rasmus, and she said that nearly all of these students and professors rely on grants funded by the government, specifically uh, coming from NOAA, some of them. So with this 17% proposed budget cut uh, to NOAA, many of this funding could be redirected or even disappear, yeah. affecting our university. So do you think that we're prepared to sustain the pursuit of knowledge in the physical sciences without this federal funding? I do think that universities would be seriously affected, but most importantly, society would be seriously affected. In the case that, um, that we're talking about, we are 
uh, although we do rely fundamentally on federally sponsored research, remember this is highly competitive. Each of those grants, there's huge competition. That's what's produced the best universities in the world and the best research apparatus in the world, which is located in the United States. It's hugely competitive. Uh, so we need to preserve that. At the same time, what we're doing is we're trying to help our research to be even more competitive because those cuts means that it will be, get even harder to get funded. And then also to try to diversify, to partner with industry, to look for technological innovation, uh, to, to, to try to develop fresh sources of funding. But at the end of the day, and, and certainly to look to philanthropy as well, philanthropists who are increasingly uh, trying to fill those gaps, but at the end of the day, there is no substitute for federal sponsorship of research. And that every survey shows that sponsorship of research is one of the most popular items of the budget among taxpayers. Uh, so I hope that, you know, as the Congress fulfills its responsibility, it, it puts back some of these essential resources which underlie every other dimension of progress in uh, American society. Many undergraduate students and graduate students are concerned about their future fields. So Lexi Strum is a senior marine science and biology major here at the U, and she said to me, pre-election I was going to try and work for NOAA or go to grad school. Since this has happened, there's not really a career in government anymore, so I have to go to grad school. But now I'm only guaranteed two years of funding, so everything is up in the air, and I don't know what happens after two years if no funding is left. So she was talking about a five-year PhD track, and she's only got two years for funding. Nicole Lee, a senior meteorology student, says, I feel like I wasted my time and money for a science that people don't take seriously. When people try to politicize climate change and meteorology in general, if you took one of my classes, you would see it's science, it's not political, now more than ever. Do you have any suggestions or advice for concerned students like Lexi and Nicole who currently go here and prospective students down the road who want to pursue a career? Absolutely, Absolutely. and the, the advice is do not be discouraged. I mean, this is not, this is far from being a unanimous view. I, I would even say this is not a majority view. The fact that there are some groups that either minimize or deny science, that is not the majority view. And we should not be discouraged uh, by, by that. If we give up and we say, well, then let's go back to the dark ages. Let's give up science because there's a group, maybe powerful, but still only a, a group that doesn't believe in scientific evidence. I think we would be doing the greatest disservice to ourselves and to our children and grandchildren and then the generations to come. We need to persevere. Every single advance that has led to more wealth and better standards of living has its beginning in a scientific breakthrough. Everyone, you know, give me any example. So I would tell the students, do not be discouraged. If you take this longer perspective, you will find that science is one of the most rewarding careers and one of the careers that has potentially the largest impact on society and on the quality of lives of, of, of people, of individual people. It's not just social impact as an abstraction, it's people who live better, children who don't die, you know, co uh, communities that are not going to be underwater because we were able to anticipate and devise solutions to deal with rising sea levels. It is hugely consequential. So very few things you can devote your life to would have a greater positive impact than a career in science. And, you know, this is a large country, a diverse country, and the opinions of particular groups should not be dictating our career choices. We should be empowered to take the choices that we believe in. So taking into account all of the challenges that we're facing, especially here in South Florida, are you optimistic, pessimistic, or realistic about our future? I, I, I am. A realistically optimistic. <laughs> so I am optimistic about our future, um, both as a university and as a city and a region, uh, because I do believe on the power of uh, science and reason to generate solutions. I think there is a growing awareness of the need for decisive action. All of that awareness comes from 
scientific research. And as we move forward in the discovery of, of, uh, of, of possible solutions, we again need to rely. And as I say, it's interdisciplinary research that brings together the natural sciences, the social sciences, uh, engineering, architecture and urban planning, and the humanities. Uh, uh, so I am realistically optimistic that if we mobilize those uh, resources, uh, we will be able to meet this challenge. But it will require that the citizens are involved, that citizens send clear messages that, you know, one, the, the, probably the, the most fundamental duty of government understood as the way, in democracies as the organized citizens, uh, one of its absolute duties is the protection of people. And environmental protection is, an, is one of the fundamental dimensions of protection. The security that you, the environment in which you live will not either get you sick or will not uh, evaporate your assets uh, or destroy your assets. That kind of security is absolutely essential. So 30, 40, 50 years from now, you think the EU is still going to be going strong? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we are, you know, I've been saying, you know, we're about to turn 100 in eight years. The university will be celebrating its 100th anniversary. And Article 4 of the Charter says the university shall exist in perpetuity. That was the vision and the greatest aspiration of our founders. And I think we are on track to realizing that idea of being around in perpetuity, which means, you know, developing the foundations and also making sure that our, the city of which we are a part is around for the long run. And that means tackling some of these pressing environmental challenges that we've been talking about.